This video is envisioned as an overview of spinal anesthesia with elements of anatomy, physiology, techniques, and prevention of complications. And of course, spinal anesthesia is a huge topic and I can spend a whole week talking about spinal anesthesia and clinical tips and pearls. But in this video, we will discuss and animate some of the main aspects of the technique so that the viewers can get a solid understanding of spinal anesthesia regardless of their educational level. And if you watch to the end of the video, I'm certain that you will see some super valuable information whether you want to learn or teach spinal anesthesia. And if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe so you do not miss the upcoming Spinal Anesthesia 2 and 3 for the pros. Spinal anesthesia, also called a spinal block or subarachnoidal block or an intrathecal block, is an injection of the local anesthetic or opioid into the subarachnoid space. An injection is usually done using a very fine needle placed into the spinal canal below the conus medullaris and into the subarachnoidal or intrathecal space. In performing a lumbar puncture or spinal anesthesia, the needle has to pass through several different layers. This is skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, then we have the ligament of flavum, the dura, and finally the subarachnoidal space. The autonomic nerves regulate many body functions and organ functions, as an example, the heart rate, the blood pressure, and ability to void or urinate. The somatic nerves, on the other hand, transmit the information from the periphery to the brain and from the brain to the periphery. So when you accomplish spinal anesthesia, you basically have a complete stop in a transmission. Spinal anesthesia will reduce the heart rate will decrease the blood pressure and will make you unable to urinate until the autonomic nerves recover, which may take longer time than for the somatic nerves to recover. Once you administer spinal anesthesia, the patients lose the ability to discriminate between hot and cold on their skin, which we use to determine the level of anesthesia based on whether they're able to perceive hot and cold. And at the same time, the block of the autonomic system also causes the blood pressure to go down. So immediately after injection of the spinal anesthetic, you can observe how the blood pressure slightly comes down. All of those signs are signs that indicate the spinal anesthesia is starting to work. As the spinal anesthesia continues to evolve after the injection, the patients then lose the ability to sense their extremity. So all of a sudden they cannot sense their lower extremity and yet they're still able to move them. Eventually, after 15 to 20 minutes, once the spinal anesthetic has had a chance to set in, you also lose the ability to move and that causes the paralysis of the lower extremities for the duration of the spinal anesthesia. When the spinal anesthesia recedes, what you start seeing, the patients start being able to move their extremities, then they get a sensation back, and only then, after some time, do they recover with the autonomic nervous system as well. So this is why you cannot send patients home immediately after they acquire the ability to sense their lower extremities and walk, because it, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems are still blocked and for the time that they are blocked, the patients will not be able to sustain the blood pressure. They can have a postural hypotension or inability to urinate. We have to wait until the autonomic nervous system recovers as well. Now, spinal anesthesia is always performed below the level of the conus medullaris. In other words, the spinal cords ends somewhere between T12, L1, and at that point, what comes down in the intrathecal space are the terminal nerves. And these terminal nerves, we call them cauda equina. And the cauda equina is a term that actually comes from the Latin. Cauda means tail, and equina means horse. So it looks like a horse's tail as it comes down in the intrathecal space. That is where the name comes from. Now, below the conus medullaris, there's no danger of injuring the spinal cord. However, 
any mistake of performing a spinal anesthetic higher above the conus terminalis can result in disastrous consequences. And this is why it is just so much important to perform an adequate determination of the level at which we perform in a spinal anesthesia to avoid these complications. And we will talk about that in a little bit. Now, the mechanism of action of spinal anesthesia is threefold. Number one, spinal anesthetic injected in intrathecal space blocks the coda equina or the terminal nerves that are descending in the intrathecal space. Number two, the spinal anesthetic or local anesthetic injected into the intrathecal space also redistributes towards the spinal cord as well. In addition to the action of the local anesthetic on the cauda equina or the terminal nerves inside the intrathecal space, local anesthetic injected into that space also works through diffusion from the CSF to the PIA matter and to the spinal cord. Via this mechanism, we only affect only the most superficial portion of the spinal cord. But the second mechanism is by extension into the spaces of Virchow, Robin, which are the areas of the matter of the spinal cord that are surrounded by blood vessels, and they penetrate deeper into the central nervous system. That is the most significant mechanism of action of the local anesthetic inside the intrathecal space. But since the typical point of injection is at about L3, L4, or L4 and L5 level, the spinal anesthesia or local anesthetic redistributes proximally and distally. And what the eventual level of spinal anesthesia we are going to obtain depends on a number of factors that we will talk about in a minute. Here's an example of how the spinal anesthetic or local anesthetic inside the intrathecal space distributes. So once the needle is introduced into the intrathecal space and the local anesthetic is injected, it simply redistributes into the intrathecal space to some point or level, proximally and distally. That distribution or the amount of the distribution or how high the local anesthetic will reach inside the intrathecal space depends on how much of the local anesthetic we use. And yes, there are other factors that influence the distribution, such as the concentration of the local anesthetic, the paricity, and things like that, that we will talk about. But ultimately, it is usually the dose which is the most determinant factor. Here's some factors that will ultimately determine how high the level of spinal anesthesia we're going to get. Let's divide these into three parts. There are properties of local anesthetic solutions, there's patient's characteristics, and there's technique. Let's talk about properties of local anesthetic. These are the important ones. Baricity, dose, volume of the spinal dose, and a specific gravity. Of these factors, every one of them is important. Baricity means that the local anesthetic injected would float according to the relative difference in baricity between the local anesthetic solution and the CSF. In other words, if it is an hypobaric, it was going to float up. If it is hyperbaric, it is going to sink down. If it is isobaric, which is what we use the most today, it is going to stay at the place at which it is injected. This is why isobaric solutions are probably the easiest to use. Clearly, the higher dose we inject, the more of the local anesthetic will end up distributing throughout the intrathecal space. Volume, just the same. If you inject more of the volume, even with the same dose, there's a good chance that it will reach higher. Let's talk about patient characteristics. Position during and after injection is very important, particularly with hyperbaric and hypobaric solutions. In other words, if you have the patient sitting and you inject a hyperbaric solution, then the level will be low. If you, however, right after the injection, position the patient in a supine position, that level can really go very high into the thoracic levels and cause a high spinal anesthesia. If you use the isobaric solution, then the local anesthetic typically stays more or less a couple of levels up and above at the point at which you injected it. Height of the patient is very important. The taller the patient, you need to give the higher of a dose. 
spinal column anatomy, the variations of the spinal canal anatomy, such as spinal stenosis, can influence it as well. As an example, decreased cerebrospinal fluid volume can also influence the spread of the local anesthetic so you get higher levels. Patients who have increased intra-abdominal pressure, such as due to the weight, overweight, or pregnancy, also are a lot more sensitive to the local anesthetics, and they tend to have higher levels with the same dose and the volume. Let's talk about the third factor, which is technique. Clearly, the site of injection determines in a great extent how high of the block you will have. In other words, you will get a lot higher block with an injection at L1, L2 than with the L5 and S1. The orientation of the needle bevel can also influence the spread. In other words, most of the needles that I use today for spinal anesthesia are the fine gauge atraumatic needles that have opening on only one side of the needle. Therefore, if that opening is rotated upwards or up during the injection, you may get a lot more spread to the higher levels of the thoracic spine. But if you orient the bevel down and inject with a certain speed, then most of that injection may actually go down towards the lumbar and sacral elements, and you may get lower level of spinal anesthesia. So we talked about properties of the local anesthetic, patient characteristics and the techniques, and all of these things can influence the height and the extent of the spinal anesthesia. Most of the needles that I use for spinal anesthesia today are usually fine gauge needles, such as 25 to 29 gauge. And the reason why we use these fine gauge needles with atraumatic or bullet tip uh, design is because they tend to get through the anatomical structures and dura in particular with the minimal damage to the dura. So once we pull the needle out, there's less risk of a leakage of the CSF outside of the interthecal space. And the leakage of the CSF can lead to one of the most common complications of spinal anesthesia, which is called postural puncture headache. Now, the postural puncture headache occurs typically in younger people and more in women than in men. But we have to weigh the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, when we selecting the spinal anesthesia equipment. And by and large, most spinal anesthetics today are administered using an introducer of a larger gauge that allows us to pass the needle deeper through the ligament and tough tissues controllably, and then passing a fine gauge spinal needle into the interthecal space for injection of the local anesthetic to reduce the risk of the postural puncture headache. And we do know from multiple studies that it's very easy to underestimate the level. What we think is L4, L5 could easily be L1 and L2. And therefore, these small errors can really lead to disastrous consequences. This is why I always suggest to do a reality check each and every time we do the palpation test. So what we see L4 and L5 it is based on the palpation of the iliac crusts must be confirmed by the Hadzik test. And the way we do this is as follows. From the tip of the neck to the bottom, we're going to call this the length of the spine. We simply divide this length into three equal thirds, and we want to make sure that our injection occurs always in the lower third. And this is a typical spinal anesthesia set. So what we see here is a basin for medication. This is typically used for spinal dose, and this is used for local anesthetic for skin infiltration. We have a choice of local anesthetic. In this example, we have Marcaine or Vipivacaine and Ropivacaine. Here we have syringes and needles that are used during the technique. We have typically two syringes. The five milliliter syringe is used to draw up medication for infiltration of the skin and subcutaneous tissue to make the procedure more pleasant for the patient. With that syringe, we typically use 25 gauge or 27 gauge fine needle to infiltrate the tissues underneath the skin. And then we have a three milliliter syringe that is used to draw up spinal dose or local anesthetic for the spinal anesthesia. That syringe is eventually used to inject local anesthetic into the interthecal space. 
These two needles are the introducer needle, which is typically 22 gauge, and a fine atraumatic spinal needle, which is typically 27, 25 to 29 gauge. Once the introducer needle is placed between the ligaments, only then the spinal anesthesia is introduced through the introducer needle to reach the intrathecal space. And not to forget, any kit will also contain antiseptic solution for cleaning of the skin, as this procedure is always performed strictly sterilely with sterile gloves and under sterile conditions. Let's do the spinal anesthesia now. That's the set that we talked about earlier. Local anesthetic for infiltration with 2% lidocaine, 25 gauge needle for infiltration, introduce a needle, fine spinal needle, and the local anesthetic dose. In this case, it is two milliliters of 0.5% bupivacaine. Let's get started. So the procedure usually starts by examining the anatomy. And what we're trying to examine here with the anatomy it is always palpation of the iliac crests. So what we're trying to do is place our hands on the iliac crests and where the two hands meet, then we basically are looking at the midline and L4, L5 or L3 and L4. At some point in time, these two thumbs will meet. Where these two thumbs meet, that is actually the injection or needle insertion point. Let's explain. So these would be the iliac crests. These would be the iliac crests. The palms of the hand are palpating that particular point. And here's where the two thumbs meet. That would be L4, L5, or L3, L4. Now, once we have the term in the midline, we're going to use infiltration for the skin and subcutaneous tissues. And here's the needle with a syringe with 2% lidocaine. This is typically a 25 gauge needle and we're going to use it to infiltrate the local anesthetic. Now, infiltration of the local anesthetic has a couple of additional very important tasks. Number one, the local anesthetic infiltration, it's not only used for skin anesthesia, but it's also used to determine where the interspace is and whether we are indeed in the midline. Very important tip. In other words, if your infiltrational needle reaches bone or has a bone contact at a very superficial location, that means that we are not in the interspace. Every time we infiltrate, we would also like to infiltrate laterally to the right and laterally to the left. And imagine if you are paramedial by chance, you missing the midline, you did not estimate the midline accurately, your needle orientation laterally will hit the bone, again very superficially, letting you know that you are off midline. Therefore, the infiltration of the skin with the local anesthetic serves also a purpose to determine where the interspace is and the midline. The palpating hand is never moved from the point of needle insertion and we continue examining the spine by slight movements laterally. So that's the introducer needle, and here we can see a massive flow of the fluid outside of the introducer needle. Many people assume that that's the CSF, and that's why they are so scared of placing that introducer needle deep enough. But in fact, this is not the cerebral spinal fluid. This is simply the accumulation of the local anesthetic in the interspinous ligament. That needle will eventually need to be placed all the way in in order to reach the CSF or intrathecal space with the fine gauge spinal needle. Let's watch further. So at this point, we have placed the introducer needle deep enough, and then we're going to use the spinal needle to place it through the introducer. And then once we perceive the click of the dura, we're going to take the stylet out and observe the spinal needle for appearance of the cerebral spinal fluid as a confirmation of its accurate placement. And once we have the CSF flow, we're going to attach the syringe with the local anesthetic, and we first confirm that we are still in the CSF by slight, very gentle aspiration. Appearance of the CSF is confirmatory that the needle is still in the proper space, and then we proceed with the injection of the local anesthetic, typically two or three milliliters of the local anesthetic of choice. At the end, 
we also tend to aspirate to make sure that even at the end of the procedure, the needle or the tip of the needle is still in the intrathecal space. And then we remove the introducer with the needle as a single unit out together. That was the spinal anesthesia. And if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe so you do not miss the upcoming spinal anesthesia two and three for the pros.